Father and our God, our Lord and our Savior, we come before you this, this afternoon and in awe of the words that you have and the thoughts that you would have for us to internalize in our own, in our own hearts. We thank you so much for these words and we pray that your spirit will come into our lives in a personal way so that they won't just be something that uh, we have as knowledge, but they'll be something that we have that changes our lives so that we can be used by you as a tool to hasten your coming. And this is the reason that we're here and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. <clears throat> We're still dealing with uh, Daniel 11, verse 41. I'd like to start by reading through the verse one more time. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Um, I want to dissect the verse, as you see on the screen, um, into raising some questions that we can answer as we go through and put this verse together. Um, he that's going to enter here is the king of the north, the modern papacy. So verse 41 is saying the papacy is going to enter into, shall enter into, the papacy shall enter into the next step after verse 40. Prophets and Kings 548, from the rise and fall of nations is made plain in the books of Daniel and Revelation. We need to learn how worthless is mere outward and worldly glory. Bible training school. Hundreds of years before people had come upon the stage of action, the prophetic pen under the dictation of the Holy Spirit had traced its history. The prophet Daniel described the kingdoms that would rise and fall. The the scenario in the book of Daniel is telling about the rise and fall of kingdoms, geographical areas. These kingdoms that are under attack um, in the last six verses of Daniel 11 are the kingdoms that the papacy overcomes as its deadly wound is healed, as it returns to its former position of power that was taken away in 1798. The, the theme of the book of Daniel is describing a conquering that's taking place step by step by the papacy. It says the papacy shall enter into, the papacy shall conquer the glorious land, America, the United States, at which time probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists. So um, when you really uh, come to understand what this verse is saying, understand what it means, the Holy Spirit can empower that truth to bring a conviction upon your mind and heart like no other. It's saying that probationary time is just about up. The animals are getting on the ark. The door is about to close. When our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestant ha Protestantism will in this act join hands with Popery. At the Sunday Law, there's a joining of hand that is uh, described in inspiration. And uh, we know that we can receive the seal of God in our forehead, but the mark of the beast we, we can receive either in our foreheads or in our hands. A hand is a symbol of being brought into subjection, being forced. Um, people that receive the mark of the beast in their hand are, are forced into it. The hand is a symbol of coming under the control of the papacy. And in this very verse, we're going to see people that are escaping the control of the papacy. Uh, but throughout um, this prophecy school so far, I have been emphasizing the word homage and haven't really uh, said anything, defined it as yet. I want to do that at this time um, because it, it's interesting to me at least. The Great Controversy 449 but when Sunday observance shall be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall tr transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority 
than that of Rome, will thereby honor popery above God. He is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshiping the beast and his image. As men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority and honor in its stead that which Rome has chosen as to the token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. And I would suggest to you that this, this action that's being described here is what's taking place in verse 41 when the papacy spiritually conquers the glorious land of the United States and uh, this joining of hands is identifying the Sunday law but it's also identifying the homage, the homage because homage has to do with a, a, a very specific act if you go back into the dictionary. Let's read one more from Great Controversy 578 and try not to read ahead. You see the definition of homage. Let's read the Great Controversy first. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as a special acknowledgement of her supremacy. But in this homage to the papacy, the United States will not be alone. The influence of Rome and the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. Very important point. Very important point is that what prophecy teaches, among other things, one of the themes of prophecy is how the power of the papacy is restored. I mean, if you don't understand that, then you, you really don't see the papacy in as many places as you should. But this word homage, you see the, de the definition of it there. In feudal law, the submission, loyalty, or service which attendant promised his lord or superior when first admitted to the land. The ceremony of doing homage was thus performed. The tenant, being ungirt and uncovered, kneeled and held both his hands between those of his Lord, who sat before him and there professed that he did become his man from this day forth of life and limb and earthly honor, and then received a kiss from his Lord. When when Sister White's saying at the Sunday Law of the United States does homage to Rome and at the same other places she says they join hands with Rome, yes, they join hands. The, the, the tenant gets down on his knees, uh, ungirt, and puts his hands up, and the Lord comes and puts his hands over the tenant, thus signifying that he's taken control of that servant, that slave. That's what homage means. And the next thing to happen in Bible prophecy is that the United States is going to do homage to Rome. The adoption of liberal ideas on its parts will bring it where? The United States, where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the th influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Brothers and sisters, this short little verse... Daniel 11:41. Once we understand that it's identifying the Sunday law in the United States, when the papacy conquers the glorious land, then it turns the switch on for a variety of prophetic truths that we know that take place at this time. One of them is, is that Satan appears on the scene and begins to personate Christ. Another one is that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. Everything comes unloose at this point. And this verse says, at this same time, two groups are identified. One group which will be overthrown, and one will escape the hand of Rome while the group that is being overthrown is taking the hand of Rome. Um, the countries is supplied. We discussed that last time. It's in italics. Um, remove it, and it's just simply, many shall be overthrown. It's... They're both contrasted in the verse. One group escapes his hand while the other joins hands. 
The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So we know that in the, at the Sunday Law in the United States, the Protestants will officially um, join hands with Rome. Now, f for me, I think when we look at Bible prophecy closely, we can demonstrate on, by inspiration that, first let me say this, let me walk over here, um, that these three powers, one of the truths about these three powers, and there are much truth about these three powers in Bible prophecy that we haven't dealt with, but one of the truths is that all these powers in Bible prophecy have two aspects to them. They have a spiritual aspect and a political aspect and they're worth recognizing and identifying in prophecy. Uh, the beast, the religious aspect of the beast is Catholicism. The political aspect of the beast is that it's a monarchy. The Pope of Rome is your classic kingly power. It's a monarchy. The spiritual aspect of the dragon, spiritualism. The political manifestation of the dragon power is what we call socialism. The political aspect of uh, the false prophet, democracy. The religious aspect of the false prophet, apostate Protestantism. This conquering of the United States, here in verse 41, the conquering of the United States we can show um, from inspiration that spiritually, technically, when was the United States conquered? Re spiritually. 1842, the church has closed their door to the light of the hour and Babylon had fallen. Now there's a, there's a further, Sister White's clear, there's further that's going to take place. But like Russell's been saying, it's at this point that the apostate Protestantism began to carry the beast. But it wasn't done conquering the United States, it had to conquer the political aspect of the United States. And when did that take place? Ah, the Reagan years, the Reagan years, that conquered and take place, but it wasn't done. It officially reaches its climax here in verse 41 when they fully bow down before Rome, ungirt, and put their hands out and swear allegiance to the papacy in symbolism. That's what's being portrayed by the words that inspiration is using. <coughs> Many shall be overthrown, so we know that, uh, as the previous quote said, the Protestants in America, the Sunday keepers in America, uh, a good many, the, I, don't, I don't know, I don't want to put a number on them, whether it's majority, minority, because we know that there are more of God's children in Babylon than are in God's church. But primarily, uh, one of the groups that is overthrown at the Sunday law is Sunday keeping Protestants, um, but also the many are the Seventh-day Adventists that are held accountable to the light of Sabbath and Sunday, and at the Sunday law that forces you to observe Sunday and persecutes you for keeping Sabbath, um, the church is purified, and most Seventh-day Adventists will be overthrown at that time. This Day with God, page 163. Many who have known the truth have corrupted their way before God and have departed from the faith. The broken ranks will be filled up by those represented by Christ as coming in at the eleventh hour. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save, while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. Select a message is book two, page 368. When the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials, and a larger portion than we now anticipate will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You might run seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in the city of Rome sometime, and I think you'll become convinced, as I do, that, as I am, that when Sister White is commenting on that passage, that she applies it almost always to Seventh-day Adventists. But, 
If you were going to take a guess on how many of us are going to be lost at the Sunday Law where the door is closed, from my study, the safest guess would be to go back to the Millerite time period because in the Millerite time period, we have a ratio developed for us. A thousand to one. 50,000 to 50 overnight when the door shut on the virgins on October 22nd, 1844. So if we're going to try to guess how many of us are going to be lost at the Sunday Law when this experience is repeated, we could say, let's use the thousand to one ratio. At least we have that identified in inspiration. But what does she say? A larger portion than we now anticipate. The best anticipation we could do based on past history would be a thousand to one. It's going to be larger. Many are called, but few are chosen. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 385. The great issue near at hand will weed out those whom God has not appointed, and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. God's going to purify his church at the Sunday Law, and what remains is a ministry that's going to carry the message to the ends of the earth in a short period of time. And why do I say a short period of time? There's a statement where Sister White says when the latter rain arrives, it goes as fire in the stubble. Fire in the stubble. Fire in the stubble goes fast, right? The Great Controversy, 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. A large class, a larger portion than we now anticipate. In the absence of persecution, there have drifted into our ranks men who appear sound and their Christianity unquestionable. But who, if persecution should arise, would go out from among us? Brothers and sisters, yes, the Protestant world is overthrown. You know, the Protestants in the United States are overthrown in verse 41 at the Sunday Law. But many Seventh-day Adventists are being addressed here too. Many Seventh-day Adventists are overthrown. And the second group, the group that escapes out of the hand of the papacy, um, is symbolized by Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, in the Oklahoma meetings where um, the brother who was the, the theologian that did his master degree on the last six verses, his master thesis on the last six verses of Daniel 11, and he presented his understanding for 45 minutes and then had 15 minutes of questions and answers, and then we presented this understanding for 45 minutes and had 15 minutes of question and answers, and that went on through the days. Uh, he, had some, he had something that I coveted. Um, I'm not supposed to covet, but we are. The Bible says it's okay to covet the good things, and he had a good thing. And his good thing was is he could take the Old Testament in the King James and read it in the English, and then he could tell you what it was in Hebrew, and then he could define what those Hebrew words were, and then he could go into the New Testament and do it with the Greek that way. And I'd love to be able to do that, but I can't do that. But I mean, <laughs> he had a grasp of the Bible languages. And there's some br brothers in here that were at that meeting. He did have that kind of grasp, did he not? He, he was sharp. And so for me, it's always been um, a key point in these verses, the word escape, the word escape. And I've been given my understanding, my, I've been um, regurgitating the definition of escape as I understand it for many years. And I don't know if you, you brothers caught this during this time, but when I gave the definition for escape in verse 41 in the presentation, he interrupted, not, didn't stop the proceedings, but he made, he made it be known that yes, that's the right definition. He agreed with the definition that I was giving on escape, and the, you need to understand the dynamics. He was presenting something totally different than what I was presenting. We were, we were on the other ends of the poles. We were, it was a very friendly meeting. We weren't fighting with each other, but he didn't believe what I was saying, and I certainly don't believe what he was saying, but when it came to the word escape, he said, that's right. 
and he's the scholar on the languages. So what am I saying? If you look in verse 42, it says, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And that is a different Hebrew word in verse 42 that's translated as escape than the word escape in verse that's been translated as escape in verse 41. Now we're looking at the two groups. We're saying in verse 41, He, the papacy, shall enter into, shall conquer, uh, the glorious land, the United States. The papacy will conquer the glorious land, the United States, and many people will be overthrown. At the Sunday Law in the United States, many Seventh-day Adventists are going to be overthrown. And this group that is overthrown is contrasted with a group that at that time escapes the hand of the papacy. And this word, this Hebrew word that's translated as escape, means to escape as if by slipperiness. And uh, the, the illustration that I always use, which he agreed with, is it's like when you reach in to a bucket of water and try to pick up a bar of soap and it slips out of your hand. And the primary, and this is the part he agreed with, right? We're, we're right here on this point here. The primary, most important part of this definition is that whatever escapes from what ever it escapes from, whatever, this hand, the bar of soap's coming out of this hand, whatever is the escapee has formerly been in the control of the power or entity that it escapes from. That when this Hebrew word used for escape, that's what it means. It means that what's escaping has formerly been under the control of what it's escaping from, which means that the word escape allows us to uh, apply some definition to who Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon are because although they are escaping from the papacy, the word escape tells us that prior to verse 41, they've been in the hand of the papacy. So, who are Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Well, we've already been through our, our basic beginnings of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. We've been through the truth that each of the ancient prophets spoke more about the end of the world than the days in which they lived. So Daniel's portraying the end of the world. Daniel 11 verse 41 is the Sunday law time period in the United States. And at the Sunday law time period in the United States, what does Daniel do? He portrays a group of people in a threefold fashion. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And I submit to you, that based upon the testimony of two or three a thing is established, that this is the prophetic technique used by inspiration to symbolize modern Babylon, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And what Daniel is teaching with Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon, he's not teaching how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon. He's not doing that. He's not teaching how modern Babylon makes inroads on modern Israel as was done in Numbers 22 in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah story. He's teaching the story about who it is in modern Babylon that comes out of Babylon when the message arrives, come out of Babylon. And he does one other thing. He calls it the chief of the children of Ammon. So what I'm suggesting to you is that in verse 41, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon represent modern Babylon in one sense, but at the same time they are representing the people that come out of Babylon. Now brothers and sisters, verse 41 is identifying the Sunday law in the United States, and at the Sunday law in the United States, the fourth angel joins the third. And what's met, what, does the, what is the message that the fourth angel brings? Come out of Babylon. So this is the identical point in time where it's okay to portray people coming out of Babylon because this is when that message 
begins, come out of Babylon. And that's who these people are, symbolized. They are modern Babylon. Revelation 18, verses 1 through 4. The fourth angel that joins the third angel at the Sunday law. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you be not partaker of her sins and you receive not of her plagues. Now, when he says he sees another angel come down out of heaven, what other angel did he see come down out of heaven? Because he just says, I seen another angel come down out of heaven. Where's the angel he saw come down out of heaven? Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. When Christ came down in 1840, with the little book open in his hand that was the increase of knowledge that empowered the Millerite movement in the 1840 to 1844 time period. This angel is repeating that history. And this angel, that history, by the way, climaxed with the second angel's message, purifying the church. This angel is giving the same message, and it's come out of Babylon. (coughs) Maranatha 173. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will hear the call, Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18.4. Now, brothers and sisters, these people here that are left to receive strong delusion, do you remember when we were... um, in the purification of God's church that we brought the quote out that Sister White says, there's one corporate group of people, this is my paraphrase, but there's one body of people, corporate, that is the first group that the Holy Spirit leaves. You remember who she said it was? Those that have received great life and opportunities are the first to be left. And they receive strong delusion. This is, what, this is just taking it a step further. They received the strong delusion completely and fully when the church is purified at the Sunday law and they received the mark of the beast. And at the same time, the fourth angel joins the third and the call goes forth, come out of Babylon. And Daniel in chapter 11, verse 41, symbolizes modern Babylon with Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he says from that group, there are people that escape the hand of the papacy. They have formerly been in the hand of the papacy before the Sunday law, but at the Sunday law in the United States, they escape his hand just as the bar of soap slips out of our hand in the water. That's what Daniel's teaching in verse 41. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Luke 17, 29 and 30. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You see, brothers and sisters, uh, two of these families um, are used over and over again to, in a general way, um, represent the enemies of God. And that's Moab and Ammon. You find them in scriptures using, used as a, in a general way just to represent Uh, the enemies of God, and they're both descendants of Lot. It was Lot that was pulled out of Sodom and Gomorrah as a symbol of those enemies that escape during this time period. Early writings, 278, 279, servants of God endowed with the power from on high with their face lighted up and shining with holy consecration went forth to proclaim the message from heaven. Souls that were scattered All through the religious bodies answered to the call, and the precious were hurried out of the doomed churches as Lot was hurried out of Sodom before her destruction. Lot's descendants are Moab and Ammon. 
chief, very important word here, very important word. Notice the definition of chief. Rashith, from this, the same as 7218, the first in place and time, or order, or rank, specifically first fruit. When it says the chief of the children of Ammon, it's saying that Edom, Moab, and Ammon that escaped the hand of the papacy, Daniel saying symbolically, what we need to understand here is that this is the first fruits of the people that come out of Babylon. They're the first fruits. And when are the first people that come out of Babylon during the loud cry message to stand with God's people? When did they first begin to come out? At the Sunday law in the United States. And that's why Daniel says it's the chief of the children of Ammon because chief means first fruits. And why am I so sure about that? Or why do, well, because in um, Isaiah 11, which we have been dealing with uh, off and on, remember Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1, is the Sunday law, according to Sister White. Isaiah 10 continues on. It doesn't stop at the end of the chapter. chapter, chapter. Um, in verse 14, Let's go to verse 16 of Isaiah 11 to try to make this point first. 10.1 is the Sunday law in the United States of Isaiah 10.1. And it begins to tell us the story of the haughty Assyrian, the papacy, and how he comes to his end. And it continues down to history until we get to verse 15 and 16 of Isaiah 11. And it says this. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it into seven streams, and make men go over dry shot. What's it mean to make men go over dry shot? Over a stream, dry shot. It means there's a river, and I'm going to walk over it, and it's dry. Has that ever happened before? Jordan. The Jordan? The Jordan? and the Red Sea. This is talking about the deliverance of God's people. Notice the next verse. And there shall be a highway for the remnant. Who's the remnant? This is the end of the world. There's a highway for the remnant. This is the final deliverance. And there should be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like it was to Israel in the day he came up out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah here is describing a sequence of events that begins with the Sunday law in the United States in Isaiah 10.1. He's focusing primarily upon the Pope of Rome as symbolized by the haughty Assyrian. But the, the scenario just continues on till we get here to the end of chapter 11. And here's the final deliverance being portrayed by using the history of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Do you see that? I mean, that's pretty simple symbolism. You follow me on that? Okay. Let's back up a couple verses, just before the final deliverance. Let's go to verse 11 and lead down to this final deliverance. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people. Uh, we had a little discussion after our last meeting about scattering and gatherings, and I was pointing out that there is two gatherings, and there's also two second gatherings, but this is part of the prophetic testimony towards that. I would encourage everyone to take your concordance and your Ellen White CD-ROM and run scattering and gathering. There is a mountain of light connected to those words. But it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people who it shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. In early writing, Sister White talks about this very verse. And what is the ensign that she says is set up for the nations after quoting Isaiah? The Sabbath? That's one. Some places she says the law of God. Other places... She says it's the righteousness of Christ is that ensign. Do you know what else she says? It's God's people. They're all the same thing. You're right. They're all the same thing. But the ensign is set up. Okay. 
And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. Now, what's being discussed here? When is the ensign set up that draws all the people of the world, gather them together? It's the Sunday law. This is the Sunday law again. This is when the Sabbath, the law of God, and the character of Christ is lifted up before the world. That's the time period that we're in here. Well after the Sunday law in the United States, because that was in verse 1 of chapter 10, and we're moving towards the end of chapter 11. And gathered together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, and the envy also of Ephraim shall depart. And what's the envy of Ephraim? Sister White deals with this in early writing, and it has to do with the story of Gideon, which is the story of Adventism. And the envy, Ephraim's envy was that Gideon didn't call him to the battle of the Lord, and if you remember, Gideon didn't argue with Ephraim about it. Just, you know, let it pass. He was a wise man in that point. But what Sister White uses this history for, from verse 12, from verse 13, is to say this is symbolizing the unity of me message and purpose that comes in to God's people at the end of time. Brothers and sisters, believe it or not, it's sometimes this is hard to believe when, you, when you're in the environment we're in today, but we're told that God's people come into unity of message, among other types of unity. We're going to be all speaking the same message. I find that humanly hard to understand how that's going to happen. But he, that's the promise. We're going to figure out the same message. The, and the envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they, God's people that are in unity, they, but they shall fly. Sister White says during this time period, it goes as the fire in the stubble. They shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together, and they shall what? They shall what? They're going to lay their hand. What's that mean? To be brought into subjection. God's people are going to lay their hand upon who? Upon, upon Edom, Moab. and the children of Ammon. Only one difference here with, with uh, Daniel 11.41. There's only one difference. What's the difference here? No chief. Because the next thing to happen is the final deliverance. Here Isaiah is using the identical symbol for modern Babylon and to portray the people that come out of Babylon, but Isaiah is identifying the very last people that come out of Babylon before Michael stands up, human probation closes, and the final deliverance is here. And because of that, it isn't the chief of the children of Ammon, it's just simply the children of Ammon. And just as the story, the testimony of modern Babylon's attack on modern Israel has two witnesses in Scripture, in Numbers 22 and Nehemiah, there are two witnesses to the the meaning of modern Babylon in terms of being the place where God's other children come out of are in Scripture. One is in Isaiah 10 and onward. One is in Daniel 11. Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. Um, notice also, it says, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. You have two, two indications that the people coming out of Babylon, they come under the hand of God's people, and it says they are going to obey them. Now, end time Bible prophecy is portrayed as a warfare, as a spiritual warfare, and Isaiah is using this terminology. It's not like the people that come out of Babylon are going to be slave labor for um, the Adventists that are sealed at the Sunday Law. That's not what's being said. What's being said? How are they going to obey them? What's the obedience and the submission that's being portrayed with the laying on of the hands and they will obey them? You know what it is? 
It's the fact that at that point in time, these people are representing Christ fully, and they are going to accept the very same message, and they're going to come into obedience to that truth in the sense that they too are going to be reflecting Christ fully at that time. That's the obedience. That's the subjection. We're all going to be fully in subjection of Christ, fully reflecting his character, even those people that come out of Babylon and stand with us. And that's what's being symbolized in this prophecy. And we've went through those verses. So, what are we saying? Ah, I almost tempted, we have some time left to move into next, the next presentation. Ah, verse 42 and 43. We have, we've finished off a book. That doesn't necessarily mean we're halfway through, but um, we have finished off a book. Let's look at verses 42 and 43 and see how far we get. Um, a, as I understand it, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm not going to hold us here into lunch. Don't worry about that. Um, verse Daniel 11, verses 42, 43. What we're suggesting here is that in verse 40, at the time of the end in 1798, atheistic France began a war against Catholicism, but the verse promises that in some, at some time in the future, the King of the North Catholicism would mount a counterattack against atheism, the King of the South, <coughs> which at that time had moved to the Soviet Union, and when the counterattack was launched, it would be carried out by an alliance between the United States and the Vatican, and the United States would contribute military and economic strength to that alliance, and that when the King of the South, the Soviet Union, was swept away, that the papacy would move across the former countries of the Soviet Union and reestablish its spiritual authority in those countries as it has done. And in that history, the coming together of the two powers of Revelation 13 would begin. The first power of Revelation 13 being the papacy, the second power of Revelation 13 being the United States. And the United States would um, be preparing the logical connection to verse 41, which is the Sunday law. The image is beginning to be formed in the Reagan years for sure, and it's going up, and then when verse 41 arrives, the papacy conquers fully, the United States, and many will be overthrown at that time, but there will be a group that escapes the hand of the papacy at that time, and that group are those of God's other children that are in, still in Babylon. This is a conquest, and the next point of conquest, the third geographical area of conquest for the papacy at, that, at this point is verses 42 and 43, which I almost always deal with as one verse. They're both dealing with Egypt, a little bit different aspects maybe, but this is the third point of conquest. So let's read verses 42 and 43. This is where, by the way, let me, let me remind you, there is much great light from my understanding in the two Romes, in pagan Rome and papal Rome. Pagan Rome and papal Rome are two witnesses of what modern Rome will be. And those two witnesses, pagan Rome and papal Rome, teach us that pagan Rome and papal Rome both began to rule supremely after the third geographical obstacle was overcome. So we are dealing with the verses, the third geographical obstacle for the pa modern papacy. This is where the deadly wound is healed because this is where prophetically the papacy returns to its former position of power and rules supremely until it comes to its end and none to help in verse 45. That's the prophetic definition of the healing of the deadly wound in spite of others that are out there. Verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. What is Egypt? 
Testimonies, Volume 1, page 131. Why is it so hard to lead a self-denying, humble life? Because professed Christians are not dead to the world. It is easy living after we are dead, but many are longing for the leeks and onions of Egypt. They have a disposition to act and dress as much like the world as possible and yet go to heaven. Some, such climb up some other way, they do not enter through the straight gate and narrow way. Now, brothers and sisters, the most, I don't know if it's the most, one of the most important rules in determining a symbol in Bible prophecy is context, okay? Context, it has to be context. What does the lion symbolize in Bible prophecy? Babylon. Babylon. The lion symbolizes Babylon in Bible prophecy. Jesus. Satan. Judah. Judah has to be determined by context. And if someone wants to argue whether Egypt really is symbolizing the world here, then we need to put it in context to be sure. And we've read a quote twice in the prophecy school so far. I think twice. I know once. I think twice. Where Sister White, I emphasized it a few presentations ago, Sister White, speaking of Rome, she says, when it comes to Rome, prophecy tells of a restoration of her power. Remember that quote? I purposely emphasized it. Here we are at the end of the world in Daniel eleven forty to 45. Why do I say at the end of the world? Because Daniel 12, 1, Michael stands up. We know we're at the end of the world. These sequences of verses are portraying the end of the world, and we, inspiration tells us that Bible prophecy is teaching about a restoration of power for the papacy. So when we come to Egypt, the context of Bible prophecy just before human probation closes, the context of Bible prophecy is the restoration of power for the papacy. And to apply Egypt as a symbol of the entire world, when we know that the papacy is going to conquer the entire world, is in perfect context with the passage. It's in perfect context. But it's also taught over and over again. Testimonies, Volume 5, 217 and 18. I am filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed, up, closed heaven to us, but our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. Pride, covetousness, and love of the world have lived in the heart without fear of banishment or condemnation. The church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Have we not been seeking the friendship and applause of the world? rather than the presence of Christ and a deeper knowledge of his will. The world is symbolized by Egypt. The plagues of Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Great Controversy 627, 628. Manuscript Releases, Volume 10, page 240. The Lord God of Israel is to execute judgment upon the gods of this world as upon the gods of Egypt. Egypt symbolizes the world. Signs of the Times, March 6, 1884. Many are not growing strong because they do not take God at his word. They are conforming to the world. Every day they pinch their tents nearer to Egypt when they should encamp a day's march nearer the heavenly Canaan. Now this word escape in verse 42, what we're saying here in verse 42 is the, the next obstacle for the papacy after the Sunday law in the United States is symbolized by Egypt. And he, in verse 42, he stretches forth his hand. And what does hand symbolize? Being brought into subjection. He's now going to bring Egypt un, into subjection or under subjection. And Egypt, in verse 42, is associated with countries in the plural once again. And it's identifying all the countries of the world. And I do mean all the countries of the world. That's what inspiration teaches. Every nation will be involved, Sister White says. And this word escape, as you can see, it's not escape as if by slipperiness. It's a different Hebrew word. And it means deliverance, an escape portion, deliverance, remnant, refugee, escape, fugitive. When you put this, ba this definition back into escape, it means that when the papacy conquers the world, there will be no deliverance. 
doesn't mean that God's people won't be delivered. It's talking about that the papacy comes into complete and full political and religious control of the world. And there's no deliverance from this point on. It's a continuation of the previous verses. He's marching. He stretched forth his hand to bring in bondage. The Great Controversy 51 is one of the leading doctrines of Romanism that the Pope is the visible head of the universal Church of Christ, invested with supreme authority over bishops and pastors in all parts of the world. More than this, the Pope has been given the very titles of deity. He has, sty he has been styled Lord God the Pope and has been declared infallible. He demands the homage of all men. The same claim urged by Satan in the wilderness of temptation is still urged by him through the Church of Rome, and vast numbers are ready to yield him homage. He's taking the countries of the world. Review and Herald, March 9th, 1886. Ever since the fall, Satan has been at work to establish himself as ruler of this earth. And Russell read a quote from the Great Controversy the other morning that says that, uh, I don't want to try, it's just too obscure in my mind right now to try paraphrasing, but it talks about that the, the Roman church was the, the masterpiece, it's a masterpiece or something of, do you know how to quote it? It's his masterpiece of a monument. There you go. It's a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne of the earth. There was the key word. The papacy has been invented so that, and designed and built by Satan so that at some point in time he could seat himself upon the throne of the earth. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Now, brothers and sisters, there's, for a long time, there was a time where I, I, I did this with a young child, and, but there was a time where I was saying that I think a young child could figure this little thing I'm going to say, I thought a little child could figure it out, and then I tried it, and it works. It's this, it's very simple. If if we agree that Egypt is symbolizing the countries of the world, okay, if, that, if, we're, if we agree on that, and that, that prophecy is talking about a restoration of papal power, and we know from our uh, understanding of Seventh-day Adventists that papal power rests upon the mark of its authority, right, Sunday observance, so if we agree together that Egypt symbolizes when the papacy brings the entire world under its crow, control through the mark of the beast being enforced upon it. If, that's, if we can agree on that. And then we look at this last quote. It says, America's first, and then all the other countries of the world. It's just like this next one. It says, foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. So if inspiration is telling us that first the United States pays homage to Rome, and then the rest of the countries of the world pay homage to Rome, and Egypt in verse 42 is the countries of the world, then you tell me who the glorious land is in verse 41. A little kid figured it out once. It's got to be the United States. It's got to be the United States. First the United States, then the countries of the world. Great Controversy 578. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent. To the very close of time, he will carry forward the work of deception. And the revelator declares, also referring to the papacy, all that dwell on the earth... Not some. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. In both the old and new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon the authority of Rome. Now we have some more to say about verse 42 and 43 
and we'll take that up in our um, next presentation. But um, as far as possible, can we bow together? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a wonderful, simple, and clear passage of Scripture. But what a powerful passage of Scripture. Lord, we ask that you would uh, make us uh, tools in your hands to understand and proclaim this message. We ask you to continue to uh, bless this prophecy school as we proceed. But we want to have each the experience that agrees with um, this fearful, fearful warning message. And we ask that you'd continue to speak to our hearts and minds um, that each of us would be in the position where we can truly be fit representatives of you as we do share this message. We know that some of us here in this group are still under the weather with uh, physical problems. We, we submit those in your hands. We submit Russell into your hands, who's not feeling well. Ask that you would heal him according to your will, that he can be strong and clear-minded as he's sharing, and the others here as well. And uh, as we part, we thank you for bringing us pretty much halfway through this um, week, and we give all the glory and praise to you for whatever's been accomplished here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.